Hey guys, what's up? It's Ashlyn here. So the video and the video quality and the camera angle look different. That's because they are. You are now with me in my little recording area, which I need to put something behind me. I know exactly what I'm going to do behind me. But this is my little recording area. Sorry, I already finished my wind up my that. But this is my little book area. My library and stuff goes here. All that fun stuff. And then my beautiful bookshelves. And then, you know, more bookshelves on the bedroom side <laughs> location. So anyway, like I told you guys, we're going to be starting a new book. So why not start it now? This is called The Gratitude Diaries, How a Year Looking on the Bright Side Can Transform Your Life by Janice Kaplan. It looks like this. I actually got this book from a single swag box. Um, and I'm really excited about it. So... It's been praised by Time, Booklist, Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, American Way, um, a few people actually. So it says on the back, um, it includes a book club guide, a Q&A with the author, and the 7 day gratitude challenge, so that's pretty neat. Um, on New Year's Eve, journalist and former parade editor-in-chief Janice Kaplan makes a promise to be grateful and look on the bright side of whatever happens. She realizes that how she feels over the next year will have less to do with the events that occur than with her own attitude and perspective. Relying on both amusing personal experiences and widespread research, Kaplan explores how gratitude can transform every aspect of life, including marriage and friendship, money and ambition, and health and fitness. With warmth, humor, and appealing insight, Kaplan's journey will empower readers to think positively and start living their own best year ever. Um, Adam Grant said, A heartfelt, thoughtful, and entertaining read on how we can bring more gratitude into our lives. It's like the Happiness Project meets Thanksgiving, a guided tour through the science and experience of appreciation. He's the author, the professor at the Wharton School of the, Universe, of the University of Pennsylvania, and New York Times bestselling author of Give and Take. Um, it says, Janice Kaplan has enjoyed wide success as a magazine editor, television producer, writer, and journalist. She is the author or co-author of 12 other books, including the New York Times bestseller, I'll See You Again. She lives in New York City and Kent, Connecticut. Um, you can go online and connect online at gratitudediaries.com, and also you have janicekaplan.com if you're interested in anything. The author photograph is... Copyright of Matt Mercado, cover design by Stephen Breda. It's got bonus content special features, so that's kind of cool. Um, it says, if you like Cheryl and Sandberg's Lean In, read the Gratitude Diaries. That's what Time said. Alright. So, this is a copyright of 2015, and the excerpt from The Genius of Women is copyright 2020. So, that's pretty cool. So, that's warmest thanks to Barnaby Marsh for his wisdom, energy, and ideas. He started me thinking about gratitude in all new ways, and for that, I am ever grateful. Um, there is a table of contents on here. Um, there's a preface, part one, part two, part three. Okay, so part one is winter, marriage, love, and family. Part two is spring, money, career, and the, st the stuff we own. Part three is summer, gratitude, and health. Part four is autumn, and it's coping, caring, and connecting. There's an epilogue, which is New Year's Eve, again, acknowledgments, reading group guide, a conversation with the author, the seven-day gratitude challenge. So, are you guys ready? Because I know I am. Um, I just need to grab a drink of water really quick, so I guess I'm not fully ready, like I said. Oops. So, while I get a glass of water, you guys go ahead, or a bottle of water, you guys go ahead, get your books out, get started, or get your pa pen and paper out and get ready to take notes. Get yourself a snack, get yourself a drink, and we will get on with the video in just a second. Unknown. Counts of 
falsifying documents on Strzok? Three, uh, Strzok. Four cops of perjury, three cops of falsifying documents. But he's still subject to a different, he's still subject to another grand jury. I know, so, I know, I know. Yeah, 302. Yeah, exactly. So, it could be anything. So, yeah. All right, three, three cops of conspiracy to steal from the government. Three cops of perjury, one out of obstruction of justice. For Bob Rosenstein, five various charges exact unknown at this time. Susan Rice, illegal use of government systems, three counts of perjury, one count of obstruction. They got it! Susan Comey and McCabe are subject to other grand jury still. Yes, 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 yes. Rich, Brennan, Clapper, Comey, Rice, Bruce Orr, James Baker, McCabe, Strzok, Lisa Page, and Susan Rice. Oh, there she is again. I'm sorry. I had to say Susan, Susan Rice again because she was a part of the uh, team that was in the White House, right? So this is so huge. These stats will I know that they don't have any of them. And if you are seeing them on Twitter, it's the first members that are probably posting. There's a reason why President Trump tweeted this. I mean, now of all of them in jail. Now it has to do with the, the Russian collusion, but this has to do with many other things. So what, let's go back a little bit. All right, y'all, so, got a little snips of what I was listening to was everybody that got indicted because Trump was tired of trying to be impeached for bringing forth some information and evidence. Um, I don't know if you guys know, I don't usually do political things, but I was told that the riots at the White House were actually a cover so they could go in and confiscate laptops from the Congress men and women. So, those that were just listed were indicted. And a lot of them were trying to overthrow the government, which is really crazy. But anyway, let's get back into the positiveness of life. Okay. So, here we go with the fruit base. And I'm just going to get a little comfortable, so if I have rolls, ignore them. Even that I am working on a new project about gratitude, I should have woken up on this early April morning to sunny skies, singing birds, and friends gathered in my living room singing Kumbaya. Instead, everything that could go wrong did, but somehow I kept seeing rays of sunshine. To start, my old Volvo, to start, my old Volvo would have sparked a jumper cable's head no effect. The neighbor who came over to help save the day by driving me to the train station 20 minutes away. I got to the city and stepped onto the rainy, windy sidewalk, just as a bus raced through a huge puddle and sent a thick stream of muddy water all over me. Yuck! I screamed through my language. Though my language might have been a bit more colorful. <laughs> a few passerby clucked in sympathy, but I didn't want to go to my important meeting looking like a survivor from a tough, mutter race. My favorite J. Crew was just a few blocks away, so I dashed over, quickly bought a bold print skirt, and changed in the fitting room. I got to my meeting on time, but the CEO I had come to see had a fake tan and extremely over moosed hair. He texted while I talked and managed to look up only at the end. Hey, you look hot in that skirt, he said. Wow. Douchebag alert. Since I was pitching a project not cruising Match.com, I should have been furious, but instead I laughed and told myself I'd been saved from working with a man who spent more on hair products than I did. I went to have coffee with my best friend Susan, whom I have known since we met in summer camp at age 8. She is intensely loyal, fiercely critical, and relentlessly blunt. You must be miserable, she said when I outlined my day. Not really. I'm trying to be positive. How can you be positive about a dead car? I took a deep breath. I could do this. The car was 14 years old and had 150,000 miles on it. I never expected it to last this long. More important was that I have a nice neighbor who came to help. Yeah, that was good, Susan admitted. How about getting soaked on the sidewalk? Look at the funny side. The idiot CEO complimented my skirt and think how lucky I am that I could buy a new outfit without breaking the bank. Susan dumped two packets of Splenda into her coffee and stirred furiously. For years, she'd heard me gripe about needing more money, so this appreciating what I had was a switch. I'm your best friend. You can bitch and complain all you want. I don't feel like complaining, I said, surprising myself as much as her. I can't change what happened, so it feels good to change how I think about it. Susan took a long sip of coffee. She has an ambitious, hard-driving nature. 
Though inordinately successful at work, Susan is often stressed, pressed, and occasionally depressed. Like all of us, she gets so busy concentrating on what she wants that she forgets to be happy for what she has. I worried my good spirits might grate on her, but she just raised an eyebrow. If this is that gratitude stuff you've been working on, I think I need it. How do I sign up? It was time to share my secret. So on the top of a napkin, I wrote the heading, Three Reasons I'm Grateful Today. Then I pushed the napkin across the table and handed Susan a pen. Fill it in, I said. Susan stared at the napkin for so long that I finally took it back and crossed out three reasons and changed it to one reason. We'll start easy, I said. That was exactly what I had done a few months earlier. I now knew that writing down one thing every day that made me grateful could change my attitude about everything else. A glowing sunset, a good friend's hug, the first hint of spring. One thing. Who can't do that? Part 1. Winter. Marriage, love, and family. Let us be grateful to the people who make us happy. They are the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. Marcel Proust. Chapter 1. I don't want to be the ungrateful lady. Grateful to be starting my year of living positively. Happy to learn that gratitude can lower stress, improve sleep, and make me happier. Lucky to have a pretty journal that I will fill with only good thoughts. My desire to live gratefully started on New Year's Eve at a few minutes before midnight when I stood at a party clutching a glass of champagne with a plastic smile pasted on my face. I knew I should be counting my blessings, but instead I was counting the minutes until I could leave. It's only 8 o'clock, guys. I'm getting so old. My heart, my feet hurt from the excessively high-heeled shoes I was wearing, and my head throbbed from the loud music that had been blaring all night. I had on a little black dress that was just a little too little, and I couldn't wait to get home and take off the Spanx. A TV in a corner of the room blasted New Year's Rock and Eve, and as I watched people carousing in California, whooping it up in Washington, and being boisterous in Boston, I wondered if everybody in the country was having a better time than I was, or maybe they were just better at faking it. In New York, the million or so revealers gathered in Times Square let out a huge roar as the ball began to drop. Since it was 20 degrees outside and they had been quarreled in metal pens all day with no porta potties nearby, I understood why they were eager for midnight. Reading in the new year would be a great relief in every way. The Waterford ball finished its descent and the LED lights flashed the new day amid much horn blowing and confetti flying. Happy New Year! My husband, Ron, gave me a brief smooch and we cleaned glasses. Now that the anticipation was over, nobody seemed quite sure what to do. The TV showed an instant replay of the ball dropping as if it were a moon landing or the final touchdown at the Super Bowl. Standing near the bar, I saw a woman pouring herself another glass of champagne. Her mascara was smudged and tears were soaked, streaking down her cheeks. Are you okay? I asked her. No, I hate New Year's. Why pretend anything is going to be different just because a ball dropped? Midnight came without any glass slipper to turn me into a princess. I decided not to discuss the subtler points of Cinderella at midnight. That's when she dropped the glass slipper and stopped being a princess, my friend, and hurried away. But her question lingered in the air. What would be different? We celebrate New Year's with high hopes and crazy expectations, which may be why a lot of us feel so uncomfortable. The banks don't help either. But she was right that life wasn't going to improve just because the calendar flipped. Objectively, I... Knew my life was good. I had two terrific sons and a handsome husband, an interesting career, and close friends. But like many people, I often focus on the negatives of life instead of the pleasures. The last 12 months have been perfectly okay, but nothing thrilling enough to make me want to put on a funny hat and dance in the street. I try to picture myself back in the spot next year. What would make me feel happier the next time the ball dropped than I did right now? I suppose in the coming months I might win the lottery, move to a Hawaiian paradise, or write a bestseller. But would any of that really work? I could already hear myself grumble that I had to pay huge taxes on the winnings, the sun on Maui was too hot, and six weeks on the New York Times list wasn't enough. If the coming year was like most, some good things would happen and some not so good. I had recently overseen a big national survey on gratitude and been on the Today Show to talk about it. The survey had started me thinking and researching a lot about positive attitudes. So I knew that how I felt about the 12 months ahead would probably have less to do with what actually happened than with the mood, spirit, and attitude I brought to each day. 
It wasn't the circumstances that mattered, but how I responded to them. I could passively wait for the wonderful to occur and still find something wrong, or I could accept whatever events did come my way and try to appreciate them a little more. I went to collect my coat and saw the woman who wasn't Cinderella getting hers, too. I hope it's a good year for you, I said. It won't be, she said. Maybe you can make it better. That's a really pretty coat, by the way, I said as she pulled on a brown shirley. It's old. I wish I had a new one. Yours is nicer. I could have pointed out that mine was equally aged and had a stain on the sleeve, but I stopped myself. What had I just decided about having the right mood, attitude, and spirit? My coat was suddenly a symbol for my whole life. If I had it, I should appreciate it. I didn't want to be the ungrateful lady. It's warm and cozy, I said brightly, putting my hands into the pockets. Whoops, one finger slid into a hole, but neither holes nor stains nor ratty hem was going to stop me now. If I planned to be happier by next year's, next New Year's, I had to start working on my attitude right now. The next morning, I woke up earlier than planned. The middle, the mild winter sunlight streaming in around the pleated shades in our midtown Manhattan apartment. After many years living in the suburbs, we had moved to the city just a couple of years ago. And I loved our large windows and wide river views. My grown-up sons joked that we'd found the one part of the city that felt like the suburbs. Weather reports predicted blizzard conditions moving in, and it had already been a snowy and cold winter. But I made myself stop and enjoy the bit of sunshine breaking through the steel gray skies. Hearing a clattering in the kitchen, I threw on jeans and a t-shirt and skipped out to where Ron was making breakfast. It was just the two of us this morning, but he seemed to have enough ingredients right across the counter to feed the cast and crew of a James Cameron epic. I gave him a little kiss and said good morning. Do you think I'm ungrateful? I asked. You don't have to be grateful for French toast, he said, flipping a piece that was bubbling on the stove. I like making it. I mean it, I mean it bigger than breakfast. Do you think I appreciate life? Oh, life? He started, he stared into the frying pan, willing it to cook up a little homespun wisdom. You probably don't appreciate what you have as much as you should. You pay too much attention to what's wrong rather than what's right. I'm going to try to be more grateful from now on. It's my plan for the year. I think it will make me happier. Maybe make us both happier. Worth a try, he said. And that was that. Resolution stated and we'd see what happened next. Ron put the spatula down and bits of hot grease dripped onto the counter. I started to say something, then bit my tongue. If I wanted to begin appreciating rather than complaining, I'd better ignore the puddle of butter gathering on the granite and concentrate on the warm smells of cinnamon and vanilla wafting through the room. I closed my eyes and reminded myself how lucky I was to have a husband who got up early to beat the egg, soak the bread, and fry them all up. Better keep it to myself that I'd much prefer plain oatmeal. Later that afternoon, I headed over to the grocery store, and as I pushed a cart along a familiar Johnny Mitchell song, Big Yellow Taxi was playing. I started humming along with the laminating lyrics about how it always seems that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Music playing in the frozen food aisle isn't usually life-changing, but I took it as a sign that I was on the right course. Hundreds of musicians from Bob Dylan to Counting Crows have recorded Mitchell's song because in any musical style, the message hits a chord. It happens too often that you have something terrific right in front of you, but don't realize it until the lover is gone, the moment is passed, and the flowers are wilted. Standing there holding a container of haagen chocolate gelato, I vowed that I wouldn't wait and mourn what was lost. I would appreciate what I had. I planned to spend the coming year seeing the sunshine instead of the clouds. When I got home, I began making my plan for a year of living gratefully. I spent my career as a journalist, so I immediately thought of gratitude as a project to research and study. I would find one area to focus on each month, whether husband, family, friends, or work, and become my own social scientist. I wanted to see what happened when I developed an attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. Instead of doing this casually, I'd make a full commitment to get as much information as I could and report and record my findings. I get advice at every turn from experts and psychologists and consult books by philosophers and psychologists and theologians. The Roman philosopher Cicero famously said, Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. If that was true, would my year's project also make me more honest, courageous, and generous? When I started telling people in the next few days about my plan to appreciate my life more, they nodded knowingly. Many insisted that they, too, wanted to be more thankful and keep a better perspective, but I got the feeling most weren't doing such a good job at it. Sure, your life is great, but how grateful were you feeling last Tuesday night when you left your office? I asked several people. Each laughed uncomfortably, and one even asked, How did you know about last Tuesday? Since I'm not psychic, I knew she'd have the same memory if I mentioned Monday. 
When we think about the big picture, we can make ourselves be grateful. But on a daily basis, a client is irritating, a boss is rude, there's a lice outbreak at our kids' school, and we get lost in the vexing details. I understood the conflict because the survey I had recently done, funded by the John Templeton Foundation, had shown that most of us suffer from a huge gratitude gap. We know we should be grateful, but something holds us back. In the survey, 94% of Americans thought people who are grateful are also more fulfilled and lead richer lives. But less than half the people surveyed said they expressed gratitude on any regular basis. You don't need to be a math genius to figure out that those numbers don't add up. We understand that there is something that makes us more fulfilled, but we don't jump to try it. It's as if there were a magical happiness rock sitting in the middle of a field and half of us didn't even bother to go over and pick it up. I was one of the people running around that field and never getting near the magic stone. I knew it was there. I kept thinking about it, but something always got in the way. I might never have focused on gratitude if Barnaby Marsh, a top executive at the John Tumbleton Foundation, hadn't raised the topic with me a couple of years earlier. We met by chance, sitting next to each other at a charity dinner, and a few months later, he took me out to a very elegant afternoon tea to discuss some of the big ideas the foundation funded. I had recently left a job at the top spot of a magazine, and I was feeling a little at odds with the world, but the most the moment he mentioned gratitude with a capital G, I looked up for my mint tea, being grateful sounded like a great idea, a nice replacement for resentment, indignation, and pique. I said I wanted to find out more and suggested the survey. By the end of the tea, I had a whole new mindset and an appreciation for cucumber sandwiches. Ooh, that sounds so good. As I threw myself into the survey and research, I quickly realized that gratitude wasn't the same as happiness. It has a much deeper resonance. Most of us feel cheered when something nice occurs. A friend sends flowers or we spend an afternoon in the park. But those moments can be fragile and fleeting. And what happens when they're over? Because it's not dependent on specific events, gratitude is long-lasting and impervious to change or adversity. It requires an active emotional involvement. You can't be passively grateful. You actually have to stop and feel it. Experience the emotion so it creates an inner richness that's sustaining in difficult times as well as good ones. Over the years, my career has gone in three directions, interweaving TV, magazines, and books. I produce network TV shows and even created some popular specials, but the editor-in-chief of Parade, the largest circulation magazine in America at the time, I'd written a dozen novels, a couple of them bestsellers. Good career on paper, but none of it made me stop and say, I've arrived. Success at work is all about moving forward. Reach one goal and there's still another to achieve. Gratitude requires that you take a different approach, relishing the moment and not fretting about the next step. Saving what you have is never straightforward. It's easy to look at someone else and think how lucky they are and how wonderful it would be to have their life and success. But what any of us feel on the inside is rarely the same as what it perceived from the outside. Until recently, philosophers talked about gratitude, but psychologists didn't spend a lot of time researching it. But in the last dozen years or so, academics have jumped on the subject and made efforts at serious research. The results have been startling. One study after another has connected gratitude to higher levels of happiness and lower levels of depression and stress. An article in the journal of social and clinical psychology evaluating all the literature in the field concluded that gratitude may have the highest connection to mental health and happiness of any of the personality traits studied. The conclusion, around 18.5% of individual differences in people's happiness could be predicted by the amount of gratitude they feel. Now that made me stop. Being 18.5% happier is a lot of happier. Pulling a number out of the air, I figured my happiness right now at about 76%, so being more grateful would bring me to over 90, a solid A. What was it going to take to raise my grade? One of the consistent findings in the research was the value of keeping a gratitude journal. Researchers have found that people who write down three things they're grateful for every night or even a few times a week improve their well-being and lower their risk of depression. The results have been repeated over and over. Keeping a gratitude journal can even dramatically improve your ability to get a good night's sleep. One of the psychologists who has led this research, Dr. Robert Amons of the University of California, Davis, jumped into the field early and quickly became one of the world's leading scientific experts on gratitude. There weren't many others. One of his findings is that you don't need good events in your life in order to feel gratitude. Instead, grateful people reframe whatever happens to them. They don't focus on what they're lacking. They make sure they see the good in what they have, he told me. Reframing takes many forms. I'd recently spent a day with Michelle Pfeiffer, the Golden Globe winning actress known throughout her career for her stunning beauty. Remember her her shiny black suit as Catwoman? 
Since I was writing a cover story about her for a women's magazine, I dared to ask how she felt about getting older. Still extraordinarily beautiful in her mid-50s, I trade with her in a moment. She admitted that it was easy to yearn for the days when she had flawless skin and a perfect top body. We looked together at a picture of her at age 25 when she starred with, a, with Al Pacino in the blockbuster movie Scarface. My breasts were very perky then, weren't they? She said, smiling wryly at the photo of herself in a revealing dress. But she didn't look back at her younger self with envy. She remembered being terrified and insecure during every moment of that shoot and was glad to be so much more confident now. Different moments in life bring different reasons to be grateful. The gift was to capture what you have when you have it. I'm really happily married now. I have a wonderful family and a handful of really close friends. I love my work and that makes me very lucky and blessed. So I get up with a purpose in life and try to stay away from mirrors, she said with a smile. Hers was a lovely and instinctive reframing, an eagerness to focus only on the positive aspects of getting older. It occurred to me that the Michelle Pfeiffer I could avoid the wrinkles in life by focusing on the joys. But in both small events and big ones, seeing the good can be a challenge because the general rule of life is that negative events overshadow positive ones. If 10 great things and one lousy one happen in a day, most of us will spend dinner telling our spouse about the lousy one. Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman says ruminating on what went wrong makes evolutionary sense. Our ancestors survived by remembering the one po poisonous berry that encountered in telling their friends about it. Describing the 10 tasty ones didn't do much good at all. We have simply updated that approach, as evidenced by every parent who has ranted about the 1C on a child's report card while barely noticing the 4 A's. Many researchers have contributed to the bad is stronger than good theory, often with colorful explanations. The psychologist Paul Rosen has pointed out that a cockroach can completely spoil a bowl of cherries, but one cherry does nothing to improve the appeal of a bowl of cockroaches. Social media has made the power of a single negative comment very evident. Check out the reviews on a site like Yelp, and then decide whether you'll have brunch at the new eatery while, where most people like the pancakes, but one guy got sick from a bad egg, or so he claims. Or will you spend a night at a hotel where one reviewer ranted about being stuck in a room with a dirty toilet and a leaky bathtub, even if others like the comfy bed and the ocean view? Some psychologists who looked into the question say it takes four positive statements to counterbalance one negative one, and others suggest five. The real ratio probably depends on the individual and the strength of the comments, but I've never seen anyone put it at less than three good equals one bad. Something to remember when talking to a spouse. All of which brings us back around to a gratitude diary, since that turns out to be an antidote to our brain's natural attraction to bad berries and bugs. At the end of the day, quite literally, thinking about what made you thankful forces you to think of the soft bed and the tasty fruit, the cherry, not the cockroach. I like the concept and I could see how it worked to reframe a day's events, but it wouldn't come naturally. I kept journals since I could hold a pen, and as a general rule, I wrote, the, wrote in them when I was irritable, angry, or pissed off. I still had my faux leather diaries from elementary school with their tiny locks and carefully scrawled, please keep out, on the covers. Later, I used drugstore-bought notebooks with lined pages and cardboard covers for my pri private rants, and some years ago, I found a dozen of them in the back of a closet, a treasure trove of memory. I immediately sat down and began flipping through, but instead of happy mem remembrances of my younger self, I was sent to repage after grumbling page of self-centered despair. Events that got me furious, fuming, or in high dun dudgeon pushed out anything else. Where were all the wonderful experiences from those years? I'd had many joyous moments, I did, honestly, but I hadn't bothered to record them. As I read the journals, I dreaded the idea of anyone else doing the same. I didn't want my husband or children finding the notebooks and thinking this was my life. Heck, I didn't want me thinking this was my life. It wasn't that I planned to rewrite history, I had just written it from the first time. So I tossed the grouse-filled notebooks into a large garbage bag and sent those biodegradable pages to molder in a dump somewhere, never to be seen again. Or so I hoped. Maybe I should have considered the fireplace. A gratitude journal would have a different vibe and never have to be neglected, relegated to the proverbial or real landfill of history. And if Dr. Emmons and his colleagues were right, it would quite simply make my life better. I like the concept, but being a journalist, keeping a gratitude journal also struck me as a little squishy. A notebook full of appreciative words about glowing sunsets and the smell of fresh brewed coffee sounded like a Nicholas Sparks novel. Not that there's anything wrong with those. 
I called my friend Shanna, who has endless energy. She teaches Zumba classes for fun and is positive and upbeat, but definitely not squishy. At age 35, she is a talented businesswoman and serial entrepreneur and has kept a gratitude journal for years. I love that you're doing this. Gratitude is completely my thing these days, she said when I told her about my plan. Shannon and her husband had a new house in New Haven, but she has some meetings coming up in Manhattan, so he agreed to meet at a tapas restaurant near Grand Central Terminal. Shanna bounced in, looking as cheerful as always, and after we caught up on important topics, the new tile she was buying for her bathroom, she eagerly told me about her gratitude journal. Every single night, she wrote down one thing that had made her grateful. Just one. No matter how busy or tired she might be, she could handle writing down a couple of lines, and she'd found that knowing she had to write something down every night changed her perspective on the whole day. As we talked, she picked up on the tapas, country bread with orange honey and figs and a bit of cream, and took an appreciative bite. Mmm, this is a good example, she said, licking some honey off her lip. It's so delicious that I'm thinking it could be in my journal. Though today it's more likely that I'll write about seeing you. I can't compete with Fig Montevito, I said with a laugh, but I got the point. By focusing on reasons to be grateful, Shana saw everything through a different lens. Our natural evolutionary tendency might be to look out for problems and peril, but Shanna had redirected her instincts. She was alert to what made her day positive. When she couldn't find something, because that happens too, she had to find a way to reframe the day. I can be going through a bad patch and feel thankful for nothing, she admitted. So maybe I'll write that I'm glad it didn't rain very hard or that I have two feet. Honestly, it came down to that once. I was glad I had two feet. I told Shane about the journals I had tossed away, and she nodded vigorously. She, too, used to spill her guts in a diary, scrawling melodramatic entries about having the weight of the world on her shoulders. You know, the gray skies outside reflect the darkness in my soul, she said, and we both laughed knowingly. Did Shana's current gratitude journals reflect a more or less realistic view than the gloomy ones? When I raised the question, Shana smiled and quoted the famous line from Hamlet, There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Okay. You don't have to be a Shakespearean scholar to follow Hamlet's reasoning. When the melancholy prince meets his old pals R Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in Act 2 and tells them that Denmark is a prison, they're a little surprised. The palace looks pretty darn good to them. Hamlet gives a little shrug, at least he did when I saw Jude Law play him on Broadway, and makes the comment about goodness or badness being dependent on our perception. Kings get killed, ghosts appear, and moms get remarried, but what really makes those events painful or not is how we look at them. If somebody had told Hamlet to keep a gratitude journal, maybe he would have concentrated on how fortunate he was to be a prince and to have his, pe his beautiful girlfriend, Ophelia. Really, it wasn't such a bad life. But for some reason, we trust misery more than happiness. We're fascinated to see Hamlet wander the stage in despair, trying to decide if life is worth living. To be or not to be seems more profound than, gosh, I'm one lucky guy. But what makes a great play isn't necessarily the poetic basis for a happy life. Okay. I'm going to start keeping a gratitude journal, I told Shana. Any suggestions? Buy a pretty one, she said as we hugged goodbye. A few days later, I was at our country home in rural northwest Connecticut and drove over to nearby towns looking for a diversion from the stormy winter weather. I would have preferred being in the Caribbean, but I made myself appreciate how pretty the snow looked gleaming in the icy fields. Red farmhouses dotted the landscape as if from a painting. I went to an art gallery I liked, then stopped in a favorite store that sells tea and teapots and other creative gifts. Browsing, I noticed some colorful journals near the cash register. I thought of Shana's advice. I had plenty of notebooks at home, but if I wanted to keep a gratitude journal, it needed to be something different. A purposeful purchase, not a leftover from a gift bag. I picked out one with a geometric screen cover, fresh and bright, too bright, too pretty to hold anything but positive thoughts. Before I went to sleep that night, I took out the journal and I opened to the first page. Feeling slightly awkward, I wrote, so thankful for it, and then paused. I went over the day in my mind. Should I focus on big things or small ones? A travel reporter I knew once joked with me that the first radio segment he ever did was about Paris. Ten years of broadcast later, he was about to record one of his favorite apple tart at a small bistro in the 7th arrondissement. In other words, it's always a good idea to focus. So thankful for it. The chance to start my year of gratitude with this journal, I wrote. I started to add, even though I'm not sure it will work, but I stopped myself. In my gratitude journal, I didn't need balance or complaints or shades of gray. It was okay to look at only one side of the story. Nobody was keeping score. I put the journal in a prominent spot on the side of my desk.
Experts used to claim that it took just 21 days to form a new habit, but a recent study out of the University College London found that most of us need more than two months and sometimes as many as six to make a real change in behavior. I hope that at some point in this year, an attitude of gratitude would become completely natural to me. For now, I would embrace the process and have a nightly rendez with, with my journal. I don't think I have time for chapter two, so that is chapter one. Yeah, I definitely do not have time for chapter two, you guys. Oh my gosh, there's so many in here. It's ridiculously awesome. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of chapters in this. It lied to me. <laughs> no, actually, it's how many sections. So we are on page 25, and part two doesn't even start until page 90. And really, I'm not too worried about, like, love and all of that nonsense. Well, I shouldn't say nonsense if we're doing a gratitude thing. Um, marriage, love, and family. I'm not really too worried about that. I'm pretty decent at that. The next section, though, is money, career, and the stuff we own. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and stop here today. I think we got a decent amount in. I mean, not really, but... Really, we kind of did. We got 25 pages in. But I want to get to reading some of my other stuff, and I need more wine. And I'm still working on kinks with this new laptop of mine. So I wanted to just jump on and say, you know, let's try and get some gratitude going. Let's maybe start a gratitude diary. I mean, you never know. It could work. It might work. Um, I do know one thing that I am doing is, um, I have a bunch of bingos, actually. Hold on. Alright, so before I forget, I have all these bingos that I got. Um, I got, like, a Peanut Blossom Book Club bingo. Um, I printed these out, actually, because I can't ever figure out mine anymore. So I got that one. Um, I got this YA reading one, because as you guys know, I do my bingos and stuff. Um, I got this really cute colorful one I thought would be fun. So it looks like that, and these will, some of these will actually fit in the book, <laughs> the notebook, my reading log, which is up there right now. Yeah. I got this one that talks about, like... A female, uh, female author and things like that, so that's kind of cool. I got this one that's at home teen book bingo. Completely ignore that that it says at, at home teen, but like some of these are really colorful and they're gonna be really great. Um, I actually have a horror bingo, and this isn't just for like watching horror movies. This is like if you own anything, like for instance. This one talks about uh, first seen horror movie released before 1995, owns over 20 horror movies, which I would qualify for, enjoys Rob Zombie movies, like that kind of stuff. That seems awesome. And then I came across these, and I got like two, four, six of these. Oh, wait, no, I lied. I only got five. No, three. Wait. Okay, I'm confused now. Okay, I made three copies of these. And these are the self-care bingo. Check off the ways you treat yourself. Because I want to definitely start treating myself a little bit better. As you guys can see, like, it talks about the seaweed bath. It's from the seaweed bath company. But they stay hydrated, get some sunshine, eat a healthy snack, at home workout, watch a movie, Zoom, happy hour. Take a nap, shower, bake a treat, read, moisturize, cup of tea, unplug your phone, like shut it off, 
a warm bath, talk to a friend, at home manicure, which probably would never happen because I get my nails done professionally. Um, go on a walk. I do that pretty frequently too. Stretch, listen to music, try a new recipe, sleep in, do a face mask, light a candle. Like I could definitely do some of these like right now. And this one's not the greatest, but this is a fitness. Okay, this is a good one. This is a fitness bingo card. There is sit-ups, leg kicks, four punches, lunge, lunges, high knees, squats, jumping jacks, mountain climbers, stride jumps, ski jumps, neck stretches, burpees, jump rope in place, run in place, toe touches, arm circles, plank supermans, hop on one foot, truck, tuck jumps, calf raises, butt kickers, and windmills. Because honestly, doing a bingo board for me is just so much more enjoyable. And then the last one I got is um, Summer Reading Bingo, but it's not really like summer related. It's just really cute looking. And yeah, and then this is another one of the fitness bingo. But yeah, that's everything that I got and I'm really excited to start it. So you guys should definitely check out your local library and look up some bingo boards because it makes things a lot more fun. But with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here and I will see you in the next video. Bye!